When I was 18 and a cocktail waitress in New Hampshire, one of the owners called me into his office. My heart was pounding. I thought I was in trouble. But I remember him just sitting back at his desk chair and being a uh, very casual, are you having a good time here? You have people being nice to you? And me answering him and not understanding why I'm being called in until I look down and see he is openly masturbating. I got a lump in my throat where I was about to burst into tears and I said, I've got to clean the popcorn machine and I left and I never told anybody. You know, that happens to vulnerable 18 year olds or vulnerable yeah. any age, you know. He pegged me as someone yeah. who was gonna you know, have the reaction that he was looking for and never tell us all. Yeah, not get him in trouble. Yeah. How could fear be a gift? Well, it is. These feelings are gifts. They're not things we should ignore. The gift of fear was a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, and a PhD all rolled into one. As you can see, we are joined by two teenagers, Grant and Ellie, who are gonna help us talk about some of the strategies that uh, teenage boys use, that they learned from their fathers and their older brothers and from movies and from television shows. And uh, so I'll, I'll come to them in a couple of minutes. I wanna just begin with the more serious part, which is that uh, teenage girls are the most victimized element of our society. And there's a few reasons that's so. There was a survey of prison inmates a few years ago and they had committed the majority of their crime, 75%, against uh, teenage girls. And we asked ourselves why, why is that the case? And it's because teenage girls offer less resistance than adult women do. They pose less risk to a predator. Uh, they're perceived as sexual objects, and they are exploring the dynamics of that relationship with men. So they're getting into a use of their sexuality and exploring the very nature of how the relationships go with men. Teenage girls also mix a feeling of immortality with their budding sexuality, and they often see fearlessness as a uh, form of sophistication. I'm not afraid to go to this party, I'm not afraid to get in this car with this person, and that feels like being an adult. And all of this coincides with the enhanced vulnerability that comes specifically because they're away from their parents, they're often taking their first job, uh, their first date, uh, their first drive alone in a car, and all of these things are happening at the same time. And then the big one, they are experimenting often with drugs and alcohol, and certainly uh, the boys in their environment are. And if I'm comparing drugs and alcohol, of course both are drugs, and alcohol is by far the one that has the most sinister impact on our society. Now does this mean that teenage girls should uh, be wary of every single man they meet, or should apply a kind of prove to me that you're not dangerous test to everybody? And I think the answer is no. For one thing, there is no way to prove that you're not dangerous other than to live a long life and not be dangerous to somebody. Men who are not dangerous don't have to prove anything. They simply act appropriately from the moment they meet you forevermore. And the strategies used by predators are specifically designed to gain someone's trust. And uh, so if you have a prove to me that you're not dangerous approach, the strategies are simply amped up and they might work just as well on you as they would if you didn't have that attitude. The reality is that the vast majority of people a young girl encounters have no sinister intent for her, will never do her harm, and she need not be concerned about them. But when she gets the signal, just as with women, then it's important to respond to the intuitive signal. However, it's happening at a time when she's concerned about popularity, she's concerned about being branded as a bitch, she's concerned about being branded as anything. And so men have a particularly strong advantage when it comes to teenage girls. Now, of all the lessons that a mother or father or older sister or friend might pass to a teenage girl, the very most important one of them is spelled with just two letters, and that's no, N-O. No is a hugely important resource in our lives, particularly for young women, and yet it's a very unpopular word. And it's unpopular to everybody because we grow up not liking that word. It means we don't get to do something we want. Men don't grow out of that. 
They don't come to like the word. They don't come to respect the word very often. And accordingly, since most kids grow up disliking the word, we really have to get young women to love that word because in that word is extraordinary power. Women should learn how to say no and mean it. And young boys should be taught how to hear it. We need to have men hear it, you know, the, and right now there's no real pressure for them to hear it. One teaching is that every time you say no to something, you're actually saying yes to something else. And usually it's yourself, meaning you're putting your own wishes above the wishes of another person. And that's perfectly fair and appropriate. Now teaching teenage girls or teenage boys about the things we're talking about is very difficult because we have all those movies and all those television shows that are teaching exactly the opposite. They're teaching new definitions of the word no. It's always the same in the dictionary, the definition. But in movies, the definition includes things like, hmm, maybe, I'm starting to like you, keep trying. These are all ways that young men perceive the word no. In Hollywood, there's a very popular formula. Years ago, it would be called uh, boy meets girl, uh, boy loves girl, boy gets girl. Uh, today, I would say it's more often boy wants girl, girl doesn't want boy, boy persists and harasses girl, boy gets girl. There's a lot of movies with that plot. And many movies teach this. If you just stay with it, if you're persistent, even if you offend her, even if she says she wants nothing to do with you, even if she's in another relationship, even if you've treated her like trash, and sometimes because you've treated her like trash, you will get the girl. I would ask you, you're young and in that world right now. Have you ever been too persistent? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, um, I think I thought of it as a challenge, mm. I think. So I knew she didn't date, and it was for religious reasons. So even before I asked her, I, I knew what the answer would be. But I think the same peer pressure is on guys to get the girl, you know? Yes. So there's that pressure of like, well, I can't just like let it go. I have to, you know, keep asking and, you know, trying different tactics. And I hear you. Another thing that we can all teach teenage girls is that men are nice when they pursue. Women are too nice when they're rejecting. We are literally speaking another language. Looking for Mr. Right has assumed so much importance in our culture that we've forgotten to teach getting away from Mr. Wrong. And so teens also try uh, something that they learn from their mothers and older sisters, and that is uh, letting him down easy. And in the name of letting him down easy, we just don't teach young women to explicitly say what they want. I'll just show you what, what that looks like, or they'll show us what that looks like. It's just that I don't want to be in a relationship right now. Oh, okay. Right now. All right, you're a great guy and you have a lot to offer, but I'm not the one for you. My head's just not in the right place these days. She really likes me. She's just confused. I have to prove to her that I'm the one for her. So what we see there is that if she says, I don't want to be in a relationship right now, he hears she will later on. If she says, uh, I'm still not over my last boyfriend yet, he hears yet. And he, he only hears the part, since he can choose, she's not completely committed, he can choose whatever he wants to hear, and naturally he chooses what, uh, what brings advantage to him. It's not often that we hear a very solid, no, I don't want to be in this relationship. When a man in the culture says no, it is the end of a discussion, and when a woman in the culture says no, it's the beginning of a negotiation. Once a girl has made the decision that she doesn't want a relationship, it needs to be said one time explicitly, and almost any contact after that rejection is seen as negotiation. And so if you tell someone 10 times that you don't want to talk to him, you are talking to him nine more times than you wanted to. Similarly, when a young woman gets 30 messages from somebody, and then she finally gives in and returns the calls, all he learns is that the cost of getting a call back is 30 calls. And to a guy like this, that's no consequence at all. We're built to do nothing but this, and so we'll continue calling. When you say no, do not negotiate. There's a rejection that I know you worked on that most of us have never heard, but if you can give it to us, that would be great. No matter what you may have assumed till now and no matter for what reason you have assumed it, I have no romantic interest in you whatsoever and I'm certain I never will. 
knowing this, I expect you to put your interests elsewhere, which I understand because that's what I intend to do. So it almost sounds extraordinary because it's so definitive and it's so complete and some might say it's unreasonable, but that is ultimately what a person feels when they really don't want a romantic relationship. They feel just what she said. I'm gonna put my attention elsewhere and I encourage you to do the same thing. You'll also notice that she did not say why she didn't want the relationship. And my teaching for my daughters is that it is not someone else's business why you don't wanna be in a relationship. So the rejections that she gave, the early ones that say, I'm not in the, in the right place right now, I just wanna get over my ex-boyfriend, uh, you're cute butt, uh, all of those really should be, I don't want to be in a relationship with you. It is all right to explicitly reject. You're allowed to do it. Now, if a man hears that and continues to persist, his response ought to make someone's resolve and commitment stronger, not weaker. Persistence does not prove love. Persistence only proves persistence. Failing to hear the word no is always a sign of disrespect. It's not a sign of love. The fact that a romantic pursuer is relentless does not mean he loves you or that you're special. It means he's troubled. And what starts as persistence often leads to unwanted pursuit, to stalking, and even to date rape. Just starting as persistence. Persistence is not a good feature for dating. I successfully lobbied and testified for stalking laws in several states, but I would trade them all for a high school class that would teach young men how to hear the word no and teach young women how to speak the word no. And that's not so hard to speak if it's spoken early, but it's really hard to do if you've allowed someone to get invested because you have uh, tried to let them down easy. What I wanna do is ask for your help, Baron, in that imagine that you wanna date Ellie and, uh, and imagine that you do as well. And so Ellie, I'm gonna really give you a chance to choose between these two guys. And then <laughs> I'll ask you why you chose the one you chose. And so I'll ask the kind of questions that you might ask. Uh, Baron, do you wanna get married? Later on in life. Uh-huh, and do you love women? Yes. Okay. <laughs> you like to cook? Yes. What about you, do you like to cook? No, not really. Okay, and do you uh, like animals or dislike animals? Yeah, I like animals. You? I love animals. Right, and do you consider yourself romantic? Not really. <laughs> okay. Do you consider yourself romantic? Yeah. Do you have any questions for these guys? Sure. Um, do you like to read? No. <laughs> <laughs> do you like to read? Yes. <laughs> you have enough information to choose who you want to go out with? Uh, who is it? I'm sorry, but... I would choose you. <laughs> okay, so now uh, would you explain to, to Baron uh, why? Okay, um, he's a romantic, which is always kind of an appealing thing. Well, what's wrong with him? Nothing. You like him? As a person, I would, yes, you're, you're a fine individual. <laughs> and would you go out with him if he wasn't here? Maybe, perhaps. You wanna switch? <laughs> no. Come on, do you want to switch? <laughs> no. Really? No. Oh, very good. <laughs> I don't think you could have done that yesterday afternoon, but that's very good. Uh, but really, do you want to switch? No. Wow, it's getting serious. So now let's imagine that you have uh, dated him, okay. and it's gone well, but you're not interested in him anymore. So uh, you've dated for three months. Can you tell him that you want to break up? I want to break up with you. I think it's time to move on. Okay, I hear you. I understand. And uh, although I'm pretty disappointed, I respect your decision. <laughs> he's, he's, he's manipulating right now. <laughs> <laughs> he's not done. He's gonna keep going. So you respect her decision and? Yes, and uh, I'll call you soon. What a... <laughs> <laughs> So now imagine he, uh, he calls you a bunch of times mm -hmm. and uh, uh, these are the messages that he leaves. Taking the actor role too seriously, <laughs> okay. Uh, hi, listen, all I'm asking for is a chance to say goodbye, that's all. Just a fast meeting and then I'm gone. So the best response to that is no response. Now he calls again. Listen, you won't hear from me again after today. I'm calling for the last time. That is said very, very often, and it's almost always bull. 
<laughs> it's urgent I speak with you. So now, Ellie, it's urgent. You want to call him back? Really? You're going to see him in school tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I'll hide behind my locker. <laughs> well, so let's imagine he's, he approaches you behind your locker now, and uh, he, he wants to know why you didn't call him back since it's urgent. What are you being such a bitch for? Hey, I, I called you like five times. I said it's over. I know, but I'm having a hard time dealing with that. I just wanted to t talk about it, you know, get some closure. No. You're sure? Whatever. So now you're definitely going to be unpopular with this guy, right? Yeah. Could you do what, what you just did? Is that something you would have done in your own life? Um, three years ago, four years ago? Probably not. I, I was always taught to be nice and, you know, but I, I, I don't think it's always the right thing to do. I think you, you need to put out your feelings as a young woman and we're not really taught to do that. And I think it's important. Who did the teaching, the <laughs> be nice, always taught to be nice? Um, I guess it was just kind of all throughout school. It was just like, be nice to your neighbor, be nice to everyone, and just like always kind of stuck, I guess. And it was always kind of a fear of mine to be seen as a bitch or a mean girl. And eventually I did start to stand up for myself and I kind of got categorized in that way sometimes. And I just had to ignore it because I felt like I was doing the right thing. I hear you. It's interesting about being taught to be uh, nice to neighbors. I wouldn't teach a kid to not be nice to neighbors, but I would very much teach a kid and do teach mine to listen to what they feel. So it, the, a blanket rule of be nice to neighbors is not the thing. Be nice to those neighbors that you feel comfortable being nice to because niceness extends the relationship. Niceness keeps somebody in your environment. I know you had a question. A lot of times I feel like women, or young, especially young girls, um, pose the question, we could still be friends. And I think in some cases, that's a way of letting them down easy. Yes. Um, in other cases, they actually believe that they don't want to be in a relationship with that person, but they wouldn't mind having them in their life in another way. Can you just speak about what that actually says to the guy or the boy? Sure, it's a hard transition uh, to go from wanting a romantic relationship with somebody and thinking you have a chance, because those are the only people you ask, people you think you have a chance with, I'll ask you how it would feel if somebody said, I, I'd just like to be friends. <laughs> you have any interest in just being friends at that moment? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So it, it's, that's, that's a tough one. I would say a better strategy would be to have a, a cooling off period in effect. And, you know, it's not an easy thing because, of course, teenage girls like teenage boys want a social world. And men, uh, young men, are holding out to them all of these concerns, banishment, unpopularity. So it's not an easy thing. That's why we have to teach it. It's not a natural thing in the present circumstance. Like a very important thing for young women to learn is that uh, men who cannot let go choose women who cannot say no. Right? A man who is not going to be able to let go of a relationship chooses somebody who he knows is not going to be able to get out very easily. He doesn't choose the most confident and assertive and uh, committed young woman. And and very few young women are anyway, and certainly without this kind of teaching, uh, almost none will become so. I've been friends with guys for, you know, a good amount of time, and then they will approach me and, you know, express that they're interested in dating. And I solely just want to be their friend, and I really enjoy being their friend, and I want to stay their friend, but at a point it feels like, I don't know if I can be, but I want to be. When I was younger, I didn't really know how to handle that kind of situation. It's very challenging. I can only speak for myself as a teenage boy. Um, I was a great friend to many teenage girls because I wanted to have sex with them. <laughs> uh, it's just not a common friend relationship in your teens. And I, that's, I'm not even talking about this guy who was much worse than me. <laughs> but, it's not a common or easy relationship because for both parties, the boy and the girl, it's enormously complicated. There's a lot going on. And uh, if I were just a friend to a bunch of teenage girls, then I'm suspect and then what's wrong with me? And I'm thinking myself as well as a teenage boy, well, who do I want to be in this social environment? What am I supposed to do and where am I learning? I'm learning from movies and television shows and my peers. So. It's, it's a challenging circumstance, and I think it's sad. 
that you just won't be able to be friends with some boys, but really once they've made the turn to thinking of a romantic relationship, and I open this to anybody, uh, is, is it easy to be friends after that? No. no. <laughs> I received a letter from a boyfriend from 20 something years ago, and in the letter he goes, so how do you like hearing from the love of your life? And I'm like, I've had two kids, a few relationships since then. I let you go a long, long time ago. And you still think you're the love of my life, you know? I think Facebook has actually yeah. brought up a lot of controversy. There's some people sitting on my Facebook. I'm just, you will sit there. You will yeah. not, I will not accept your friendship. Exactly. I did not want contact with you. But, and just because you found even, me on the yeah. internet does not mean yeah, I'm I, I don't. I don't. I'm a kind of a believer that it's really hard to be good friends with the opposite sex. Mm. Um, well, because as of the reason that I would you, say for sure. For sure, as a teenager, exactly. For sure, as a teenager. By the time you get to be old and wrinkled like me. <laughs> yeah. 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 My dad used to always say to me, I don't care what they tell you, a man is never just your friend. If you decide you want to be with him, snap the finger, you know, he's waiting. They're like sleeper cells, you know? It's like, <laughs> it's like it could be 20 years later and it's like, you know, I we've been friends for so long. I'm so glad you're in my life. I know now that you broke up with your boyfriend, I've always thought maybe we'd get together. Yeah. And like, it's like, what? Yeah. <laughs> a, a man told me one day that they're just waiting for their chance. That one day when you're gonna let your walls down and it's- It doesn't change and, you know, to highlight Facebook, you know, my mom's 64 and she like, you know, old boyfriend be like, hey, my wife died. Are you single? You know, I mean, <laughs> oh things goodness. like that. So, I mean, I think it doesn't change. I'm going to play devil's advocate because I don't agree with that. I think that um, you can be friends with guys and I have a lot of guy friends. And my reasoning behind this is it's not my responsibility to gauge what everyone else's intention is. It's only my responsibility when they act on it. And so a guy can be pining away for you for years and years, and that's his problem, not yours. And mm -hmm. as soon as he brings it up, when you're in a relationship with someone else and he's trying to intercede in that relationship or do something that makes you feel uncomfortable or trying to change the parameters to the way he wants them instead of what you want, then it becomes your problem and then you should react on it. But otherwise I think you may be giving up what could be good friendships because you're afraid, oh, well, he's a guy, he probably wants more. I just, I don't go there because I don't have the mental energy to go there. So I think, I think it's possible to be friends, but be aware when they start acting differently if that's not what you want. I think we have a lot more agreement than you might think, uh, perhaps all of us. We're really talking about a circumstance where the guy said to her, now I want yeah. a romantic relationship. Oh, absolutely, I have great women friends right. and, and absolutely men and women can be great Co friends. Co-workers, give uh, a chance. Yes, I think as teenagers, girls often want to believe this is going to be a friend and as often it's, that's not his intention. But you're absolutely right, until the intention is presented, uh, I think it can be a non-issue. Yes. Um, I grew up completely without a man in my life. I had no father, no grandfather, no brother, no no male person. Um, the first experience with boys or men with was sexual. Somehow it turned out fine. But um, my daughter, we have a very open relationship, and she says that sometimes, you know, a man who's maybe in his 40s or 50s, a fatherly type figure, will occasionally put his arm around her or maybe hug her. And I don't really know what to tell her as far as it's not sexual harassment. I don't know that it would really benefit for her to step back and say no, you know, and, and you know, a customer that she's waiting on or, or, or I don't know what to say to her. Well, what strikes me is that uh, the, the, the gauge or the barometer for what kind of uh, touch is acceptable and what kind isn't is how does it feel? Mm -hmm. Meaning if it feels mm -hmm. like you don't want it, then it is appropriate to stop it and you know move away from somebody and even escalate as they might escalate. Let's take it to the smallest kids. Uh, the grandmother or aunt comes over and takes a kid by the cheek and pinches and the kid hates it. Uh, the, my, my kids don't participate, even my four-year-old and my five-year-old, they do not want to be touched by somebody they don't want to be touched by, and they get a lot of support from, from us. I think even at the age she is, 19 years old, mm -hmm. a good teaching is if you don't want it, don't accept it. And, uh, you know, there's all kinds of, as you say, there's touching on the shoulders. Mm -hmm. As you get older, you might say, 
I'll take it once, these are all judgment calls, but at least to know, to be very aware of, of, the, uh, of the impulse, uh, and if you don't like it, to not participate in it. Because in fact, the vast majority is gonna be no problem. It's gonna be just fine. But when it does escalate to being a problem, that's how it starts. It starts with little tests, we call it the interview. Little tests uh, of, is this all right, is this all right, is this all right, now I'll make the sexual joke, now I'll make the comment about this, and the predator is learning through that process. How much she'll take. Or how, how much she'll accept, and uh, so there can be a moment. And there's, look, there is a cost to saying to somebody, uh, hey, that's enough, I don't really feel comfortable mm -hmm. with it, because he might be your boss. Mm -hmm. There may be all kinds of consequences associated with it. And I asked her, I said, well, how, how did that make you feel? Because mm. that was my question. Mm. You know, what kind of a touch was it? She said, you know, it, it didn't feel bad. You know, it felt fatherly. Like, he's just looking out for me. She's one of the younger ones, you know, yeah. at work and everything. But, um, you know, I wasn't quite sure what to tell her. And I said, you know, if it, maybe say something like, I have a cold, you may not want to touch me. But I, I don't know that that's the most empowering thing. It's not. Thing. It's, it's disempowering. Okay. Because you're, you're basically asking her to make up something and it's the equivalent of let him down mm -hmm. easy as opposed to just being explicit. Go ahead. I don't think that she would have brought that topic up if she wasn't uncomfortable. Yeah, that's so a she good was point. Listening. It's beautiful that's a good because point. she was listening to her intuition and her inner barometer that's already. Good point. So she obviously had the question much as you have the question. And I think the conversation itself is gonna be, is gonna be the solution. Mm -hmm. Right. I worked as a hostess, and um, one thing is um, the waiter that used to work with me, he always let me know, he said, if someone starts touching you too much or is hugging on you, you come around me and just tell me to, you know, follow you to the table or be around you. And most of the times, they won't touch you. If there's another male around or another worker with you, that, that helps. Asking for help is a great yeah. idea. I actually used to waitress and bartend a lot and uh, through high school and college. And I used to actually, like, take it like humor and take their hand and be like, ha, 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 you know, and like look right in their face and let them know with my physicality that it wasn't okay, but still being pleasant so that I'm not insulting them because they're my customer and I still want their tip and I don't want my boss yeah. to fire me. And using humor is disarming. And if she can control that by saying no, then it usually disarms a lot. Mm -hmm. I would say just as a mother and as a former waitress, they will be all over her if they possibly can. Somebody. Mm -hmm. She needs to say no. In college, I was waiting tables at this little place, these two big brothers. Every time I came in, oh, Cindy. Yeah. You know, they're like picking me up and hugging me all over the place. And yeah. I thought, oh my gosh, I'm gonna need, have to do this every time I come to work. And they're decent guys. Once I said no, they stopped. Mm. I, I've done both, mm -hmm. but yeah. the no works better. Look, every person is different and every situation is yeah, different yeah. and there is no single prescription. I won't yeah. be there with you or certainly with your daughters and there's no, you know, it has to be what's right for her in terms of the way she communicates and the way she's looking to have a continuing relationship <laughs> with people at work or have a continuing relationship with people at school. I think the foundation is that how we're touched and if we're touched and when we're touched is up to us, not up to somebody else. I moved to New York City. <clears throat> I shared an apartment with two other girls. I was at the diner right around the corner, and I met uh, this um, Jamaican older man. He, he told me he gives great massages, mm. and he um, said, where do you live? And I said, right uh, uh, in this apartment building. And he said, I'll give you a massage. Take me to your apartment. And I took him to my apartment. Right. I had a gut feeling. I was uncomfortable, but I didn't want to seem rude. Mm. I didn't want him to think I was racist by not taking a strange man to my apartment to give right. me a massage, which of course is absurd. And he convinced me to take my shirt off. He convinced me to take my bra off. And then he started grabbing at me. I jumped up and I screamed and I told him to get out and he did. You know, anything could have happened. Yeah. And it all because I, it all happened because I was afraid to be rude. Right. I want to talk about uh, a, a, a resource that we can teach to young women, which is called PC, not as in politically correct, but it now means privacy and control. Privacy meaning if you're in an environment where you wouldn't be heard, 
if you yelled out, if you're in an environment that benefits the predator rather than benefits you, and if he has control over you by virtue of the fear of being unpopular or the fear of, of saying no or resisting or the fear of being hurt, uh, or by virtue of absolute power. If a predatory man has privacy and control and intends to act out in a violent or sexual way, those two advantages make it possible for him. And if he does not have privacy and control, he cannot do it, period. Then he is not dangerous, no matter what his intention is. And accordingly, just the presence of these two features, privacy and control, in any situation can trigger a young woman's heightened awareness and readiness. Meaning the guy doesn't even have to be dangerous, you could be with anybody, but you become aware, ah, oh, this is a circumstance where I don't have advantage. And then you ask yourself the question, is this person a problem or not? You know, people ask me a lot, when are kids old enough to learn the heavier parts of this? Because some of what we talk about here is dark. With regard to women, I'm not gonna choose a number like 14, 15, 16. It depends on the parent will know and the, and the, the teenage girl will know. But I can tell you this, as soon as they are a sexual predatory prize, then it's time to learn about that subject. That's certainly 17 for everybody. It's 16 for almost everybody. It's 15 for almost everybody. And now you start getting into a judgment call about whether your 13-year-old girl is ready for this or not ready for this or is a sexual prize. Because as soon as she is, then she deserves to be given the information that the whole rest of the world knows, right? All the men know, right? Yes. I was definitely taught to be nice and uh, had a pretty strong incident at, at age 17 because I was too nice and shouldn't have, knew that I shouldn't have gone out on a, a, a thank you dinner from a, a coworker um, and went anyway, even though my intuition said, you don't really need to go out for dinner, you don't owe him anything. But the circumstances were such that we had bonded. We had worked together for three months five meals a day serving, you know, waitressing. And, and looking back, I was 17, but he was in his 40s. But we were partners, and we worked together as a team. And I was flirtatious. All those ways you just described a teenager in the beginning, mm. oh my God, it, made, it gave me the chills because you had me pegged. Now looking back, 2020 hindsight, I realized that, I, you know, from his perspective, I wasn't his niece, I, I looked at him as an uncle. Uh, for him, I was just this toy that he played with all summer long until that night, that last night. I really wanted to say no, but I didn't know how. I really didn't have a voice. And I, I told my girlfriend where I was going. Mind you, though, I didn't really know where I was going. And this is pre-cell pre phone, guys, way pre-cell phone. So I had no contact with anybody. And as soon as I got in the car, I had regrets. And then he said, I said, so where are we going? And I knew the area a little bit. And he said, oh, we're gonna go over to this hotel because we worked in a hotel on the Catskills of New York. And he took me on a really far drive and he stopped in like sort of a decrepit dorm style place. And he said, you stay here, I'll be right back. And I sat in that car and I said, oh my God, Sheree, you're in trouble. You are in trouble. But I still didn't get out of the car because I also didn't know what to do, didn't know where to go. And then when he came back, Drugs were involved. He was definitely high. And now I'm driving with a person who's high and I still don't know what I'm afraid of, but I know I'm afraid. Oh, by the way, there was no dinner involved yet, okay? He stopped the car in the middle of the woods and said, get out, get into the back seat. I said, oh, no, no, you don't want to do this to me. I said, you know me. I'm like your, I'm like your daughter. I knew he had a daughter. I said, I'm like your daughter, please don't do this to me. And literally I walked around the car I walked and he would follow me around, you know, like one of the, the car in between us. And I kept on using my voice to the best of my ability to negotiate, although I was negotiating. And I just said, please, you know, you don't want to harm me. I said, I'm a virgin. You know, you're going to basically ruin my life is how I worded it to him. And he said, no, you owe me. I said, you've been teasing me all summer. I said, oh, I didn't mean to do that. I didn't know. And that went on for quite some time. And I did, I mean, I'm proud of myself in a crazy, in a crazy kind of way, I'm proud of myself because I talked him out of it. I didn't win the battle because he, he you know, beat me up a bit and he made me do other things. But, but that's where I, I learned that I need to have a voice and there's many, many ways to use your voice. Thank you very much.
thank you for sharing all that. And are you willing to talk about what's going on? Me? Mm. Yeah. Thanks. Um, well, I went through something similar that I totally forgot about, mm. and it brought it up. Um, when I was a freshman in high school, I was on an all-boys ice hockey team because we didn't have a girls' team. And uh, a lot of the boys were seniors, and I had a crush on one. And uh, he took me home from a team dinner one night, and I live at a dead-end street. And another boy was in the car with us, and he drove past my house and to the end of the street where there were woods. And um, I said, what are you doing? You passed my house. And he said, oh, we're taking a quick stop. And the boy in the back seat got out, and then he locked the doors and uh, forced me to do something I wasn't ready to do. I had never even had kissed a boy at this point. And he made me feel like I owed it to him sure. because, oh, well, I thought you liked me. Like, now, now you're telling me you don't like me. And uh, I just feel so bad that I let him win. And I was scared. I didn't know what to do or where to go. But I wish I knew how to say no. I hear you. I wish it too. And a year or two later, another older boy from the same team had me over at his house. And two other boys were over, and we all went into his bedroom. And the two boys went into the living room to play video games. And the one boy made uh, alcoholic drinks for us. And I believe I took a couple of sips, but I felt really, um, I started feeling really dizzy and like I couldn't move. I believe now it might have been Valium that he put in there. Um, it made me feel like I just couldn't move. I couldn't remember much, but um, he started taking off his clothes and my clothes. And I said, whoa, I, I don't want to do this. I don't know what I'm doing. And he said, if you don't want to do this, and if you regret it, that's your fault. You're either going to sit here and like it or not, but it's happening. So um, good thing it didn't get too far. He, he did do a few things to me, but um, headlights came on and his parents came home. So mm. he pushed me out of the bed and got dressed. And I can't tell you what happened after that. Somehow I got home, I don't remember the rest, but. Um, I hear you. Yeah. If I was allowed to, I would be getting up and giving you a hug. Because I really feel your pain. You are allowed to, even though it's hard to get over there. <laughs> you can do it. And here's something that drives me nuts about our stories. That I bet you, did you report? Did you tell anybody? No, and one of them was a close family friend. I didn't even tell anyone until this year. I think I blocked it out, actually. Right, and I didn't tell anybody for many, many years. And, and it really was, it, we, we need to tell the kids. They have to report, they have to tell. It's very true that uh, crimes against teenage girls are not only they're not only the largest population of victims, but they are also the least likely to report. And one component of that is uh, that they don't want to tell their parents because either they think the information will be hurtful to their parents or they, uh, they want to be, show that they can use the car and go out on their own and can uh, be independent and can take care of themselves. Go ahead. Well, and also for me, um, it actually even got around school and some people were like, oh, well, I heard you hooked up with this guy. And I just felt so dirty and I would never in my life want my parents to know that I did anything even close to that. So I was afraid of being a slut or embarrassed. Those of us who are parents can work on the relationships with our kids and hopefully by modeling that for other people, help other people do it such that they know they can tell us anything. Uh, I, I would be heartbroken to learn something years later uh, that my child could have told me at the time when it would have made a difference. And uh, I've heard a lot from my kids. Obviously, you can never know if you've heard everything, but I've been really impressed and, and blessed by the times that they've come forward and told me something I really didn't want to hear, uh, you know, in terms of uh, bad news, but that I really did want to hear in terms of the opportunity 
to, uh, to support them. Go ahead. I want young women, my students, I'm a high school teacher, and my daughter included, to just take more responsibility for where they place themselves and even how they conduct themselves. As a young woman, years ago myself, I thought, well, I should be able to do whatever I please. I should sure. be able to wear a mini skirt. I should be able to, you know, have lipstick on, whatever, go where I like, and men should just behave themselves. And I thought, you know, I should be able to be um, as enticing as I like, and that shouldn't change their behavior. They should still be gentlemen. But I'm, I want a different message to go to my students and my daughter. I don't want to blame the victim. Definitely not. But I, I think we, as women, have a responsibility that if you put yourself, I learned the hard way, you put yourself in those situations, bad things do happen, and then you'll probably end up blaming yourself. To say don't have sexuality, don't enjoy yourself the way men can enjoy themselves is, you know, life isn't fair, but I don't think that's any way to live, and it's, it's bullshit. I agree, but I'll tell you what, uh, so we're going to argue now. Are okay, good, I okay. love it. Here's the argument that it ought to be different. It ought to be different. The men ought to behave much better. Young men ought to be taught and really take it on board. I ought to be able to go out, young woman, and walk down the street at two in the morning and have no fear. Yes, you ought to. That would be nice. That is not the way it is. Sure. I don't know how to find that balance, by the way. But dressing, uh, being very careful and covering up any part that could be deemed yeah, as sexualized, yeah. um, that's not going to stop rape culture that might protect you from well, it, being it might raped. not. It might not, certainly. Listen, when women are have to cover, you know, everything but their ankles, their there's ankles still, are sexual. Of course, and there's still, and there's still rape. It has to start with retraining boys. To make a better society, I'm all for that. To make a safer circumstance for the specific young woman that we're talking to, I'm not commenting on her dressing at all, what she wears, but how you go out and have fun. Travel in packs. That's, now we're starting to get to the practical logistics of it. How you do it, what you plan, do you know any of the people there? Do you have any advantages there? And, and then I have no ability to endorse under any circumstances being in a vulnerable situation and also being drunk. Right. I have a cousin who's 18. When my little sister went to college, I mean, I'm such a broken record talking to them about having a buddy. I know it's not realistic to tell them not to drink, so I say, have a buddy at a party. Mm. Check in. Make sure that you express your intentions for the night. Make sure that you don't just go to a party thinking, well, if I end up walking home with someone, I end up walking home with someone. That's not, even if it doesn't turn into assault, that's not the kind of sex that you're ever going to really feel good about. Mm. Go out with bright eyes and clear intentions and a friend who will take care of you. You know, people say, well, men ought to be taught and men ought to learn, and I agree. But you could teach young men and women all you want and then get them drunk. And the very nature of being drunk is that you lose your ability to read the room, to intuit what's going on, to communicate the way you want to. Young, drunk men, by inclination or by circumstance, they're more likely to act than they would be sober. What I just said is highly unpopular, but I have to say it to my daughters. Look, no teenage girl who doesn't have these resources because we've taught them exactly the opposite can be expected to know any of this or have access to any of this information, yourself included. You, who you're still dragging around as being guilty, as being responsible, as being at fault. Look, it would be great if we didn't have to grow and learn things in the hard ways that we do, but it doesn't really matter at what point you got your power, you got your power. You have your power. That's not happening to you next week that experience, not that way. Yes, go ahead. My story is different and I applaud Brittany so because I flirted, I was taken to a remote area, I was raped, I thought I was pregnant, I married him and I went through 18 years of hell. Her story's much more triumphant than mine. I wish I had been taught, say no, don't go with him in the first place. I want all teenage girls to know that they can save themselves an awful lot of trouble with these very ideas. Don't you think that goes back to also what we're taught that bad guys are monsters yeah. and evil and they look a certain way and, and oftentimes they're the cute boy you had a crush on. And, you know, I think that's why we don't report it. Sometimes I don't even think we recognize it as 
a crime or a problem. It was just, whoa, that was dumb. I went out with that boy and this event happened and you don't even realize you've been victimized. Yes, it's very, very true. And, and you know, your story today is part of that because much of it you didn't remember until today. And it's very true that if we teach kids that the issue is strangers or monsters or bad guys or guys who don't shave or guys who wear leather jackets or guys who look like this, they're missing the actual person right in front of them who looks like a member of your sports team, who looks like a guy you actually think is kind of cute, uh, who looks like somebody who you've spent months with and actually like and admire and uh, not like monsters. You're absolutely right. Um, the second boy, he knew what he did. I did see him the next day on Monday, and I would try to talk to him after somebody who's, you know, d did something that intimate with you. I was wondering why he wasn't talking to me. He did not want to look at me, and he acted so guilty, and I know he knew what he did, and there was something yes. wrong with that. Yes. I think that if young girls understand the reality of what we're talking about, that doesn't mean all their behavior will change. It doesn't mean they'll suddenly stop getting in the car when it looks like fun with the other people who've had too much to drink. But it does give them a chance to make better choices. Right now, we're not even giving them a chance to make better choices because we're teaching them the opposite message, which is be nice. It's a, a big challenge. And, you know, as we're talking about teaching young women to know these realities and to apply these realities in their lives, you are teaching it. Hearing these powerful stories from these powerful women, it feels really good to know that there's people out there that share the same feelings that I do and that I'm not in it alone and that nobody else is either. It changed how I will raise my children and live the rest of my life. <laughs>